this um, contest for the district and I thought that I would tell you a little bit about some of you may not even know how your child ended up um, at the district level of this all the schools hold this is a Kansas PTA contest and it's a citizenship writing contest where you're supposed to write about being a good human what does it take to be a good human and every year the theme changes and this year it's my motivation so they were supposed to speak to what's my motivation to being a good human a good human in the classroom a good human in your school on the school ground in the world um, a lot of times the high school kids are thinking more worldly but you'd be surprised where some of the younger kids are thinking that way too so this contest is held by the kansas state pta all the schools well we hope all the schools participate but they hold their own contest and then the first place winners come to the district which is here and then we hold a contest and we pick a first and second place so you're either here tonight because your child won um, award of excellence first place or they won an award of merit second place and um, this is uh, I get really I'm the reason I do this job is because I just so believe in the arts and I don't want the arts to go away in our school and I think that we do have the arts in our school but other places to be able to compete there aren't a lot of places to compete so you may know that we have a reflections art program and we honored that in January and this is our strictly writing component and it's only poem and essay in this contest and I I do this job and I volunteer for this job and I've given I think my 16 year career of in the arts the cultural arts because I just want to make sure that it doesn't go away so if you love the award the awards tonight and if you want this to continue please go thank your principals for um, supporting this program in the school please thank your PTA presidents for supporting it and please thank your chairs for um, holding this contest you also the if your school does not hold the contest you can um, enter independently but we're hoping that we do continue to keep this in the school so we have 18 schools this year that participated we have 797 total entries that is a little down we've had 1200 before but I still think it's good we had 212 poems and we had 585 essays and so tonight we are awarding 15 award of excellence and we are ordering uh, awarding nine awards of merit now not everybody is here but we pretty much have all of our award-winning writers here tonight um, so all the first place the award of excellence their um, writing has been submitted on to the state and then they will be competing at the state level and this contest ends at the state level so you'll be finding out the results from that sometime in March and then if your child if your award-winning writer wins then they'll also be honored at a state ceremony um, with this Kansas State PTA so um, I think I've covered everything so I believe we are ready to rock and roll the Burns families here yay yay hey <laughs> So we're going to start with the award of merit and that's second place and we're going to start youngest um, to oldest and oh, this contest is fifth grade through 12th grade used to be fifth through ninth but now it's fifth through 12th and oh one more thing for the high school kids remember that when you win at this contest this is excellent to put on your admissions to college um, this is a it looks really really good um, for college entrance so we will start with and here's the the first award winning writer is Haven Bauman from Santa Fe Trail Elementary fifth grade poem <laughs> oh my goodness they're so darn cute 
The next winner is Juliana Jamison, a fifth grade essay at, from Highlands Elementary. The next award-winning writer is sixth grade poem, Ethan Reed from Santa Fe Trail Elementary. <laughs> sixth grade essay, Eva Gazaway from Mill Creek Elementary. <laughs> Eighth grade essay, Eli Mazzarelli from Trail uh, Ridge Middle School. <laughs> Ninth grade poem, Campbell Wood from Shiny Mission East High School. <laughs> Tenth grade poem, Olivia Tollison from Northwest High School. I'm sorry, she's not here. So now we're down to, oh. 12th grade poem, Davis Wright, Shiny Mission East High School. <laughs> now we're going to go to the Award of Excellence. And these, um, there might be one I didn't pull, so I'll tell you. The first um, award-winning writer in the Award of Excellence category, first place, is fifth grade poem, Thomas Burns from Brookwood <laughs> Elementary. <laughs> fifth grade essay, Malia Knight from Santa Fe Trail Elementary. Sixth grade poem, Reuben Fick from Trailwood Elementary. <laughs> Sixth grade essay, Amelia Diefendorf from Highlands Elementary. Seventh grade poem, Nick Van Deventer from Westridge Middle School. Eighth grade poem, Samantha Sullivan from Trail Ridge Middle School. Eighth grade essay, Allison Vu from Westridge Middle School. Ninth grade poem, Martha Avantakis from Northwest High School. Ninth grade essay, Evangelina Rencher from Northwest High School. <laughs> Tenth grade poem, Maria Heath from Shiny Mission South High School. <laughs> Tenth grade essay, Kelly Vandenboss from Shiny Mission Northwest High School. <laughs> 11th grade poem, Michael Fitzgerald from Shiny Mission Northwest High School. <laughs> if you notice, there's a trend going on here. 11th grade, oh, these two aren't here, but they're also, I should mention them, 11th grade essay, Alice Newell and 12th grade poem, Bryce DeBach, and the both Shiny Mission Northwest High School, and then um, 12th grade essay, Juliana Cantor, Cantor, <laughs> Shiny Mission Northwest. So what does this tell you when you're in high school? Enter this contest. <laughs> this is gonna look great on your entrance. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to um, take opportunity to take photos. These photos will be out on the website. Um, there's a team of photographers here, and it'll be um, pushed out on social media also to honor your, your students in the district and out there in the, the world. 
And um, I think we'd like to do a group photo first, and then would it be possible to do an award of excellence and then an award of merit? So do you want to do the group first and then? Sure. So why don't we go the uh, littles and then the tallers, tall in the back, and then? We'll, we'll do that part. <laughs> okay. And the board members are going to be in the photo too. I want to mention on the Award of Excellence medals, the beautiful design that's on that was designed by Lori Stanziola standing over there in the doorway, and she designed that for the Shawnee Mission School District. The SMAC PTA is what we are. We're the district PTA. I guess I didn't explain that. Also, after this last photo, the group photo, there's a few more awards out in the lobby for the students and there's for refreshments. And there's also up against the greenery on the wall, there's an opportunity to, t there's a photo um, staging area that has a sign there that your writer can stand next to to get their photograph. So don't leave, <laughs> there's still more awards. If I may make just a quick comment, I think it'd be very appropriate to thank Dee for all the wonderful work that she does on this. Thank you, Dee, for what you do.
Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the February 11th Board of Education meeting. Our board president is joining us remotely on the phone. So I will be leading the meeting this evening. And we're going to begin by um, having the Comanche elementary students lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to thank uh, the students from Comanche for giving us the pledge. You know, they, they were scheduled for our last board meeting in January, but that, uh, like a lot of things lately, uh, was uh, they weren't able to attend because of inclement weather. We didn't have school that day. Uh, they were also scheduled to sing for us as part of our celebration of Board of Education Appreciation Month, which was in January. Well, it's February, but we can still celebrate the Board of Education, a group of volunteers who commit countless hours to doing their very best to help all children succeed in their learning. And so tonight, we have a special performance by the Comanche uh, Choir in honor of our board members.
That was the best. Every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that was worth the wait. Oh. I hope. And thank you to all the Comanche families who made the time on their schedule for the last meeting and then followed up and booked for this night as well. It's very much appreciated. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. And if someone could move for that adoption. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's good to hear from you, Brad. Um, and now the approval of the special meeting minutes from January 31st, 2019. I move approval of special meeting minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> a motion approved, um, 6-0. And then we have approval of regular meeting minutes from January 31st, 2019. Um, approval? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I think that's also approved, 6-0. So then we're going to move on to item 201, the superintendent report, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Fulton. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for coming out this evening. Well, as always, we have lots of great things happening in the school district. We're going to share a few of them. Recently, students, staff, and, and uh, recently, students and staff worked together to celebrate and focus on creating a culture of kindness during SMSD's Kindness Week. While acts of kindness are carried out across the district every day, this week places extra focus on creating and practicing a culture of kindness that can continue throughout the year. At the Center for Academic Achievement, we were able to see tw students from 27 Shawnee Mission schools conclude the week by putting together resources for people in need. <coughs> they put together buckets and cold weather clothing items that will be donated to extend <coughs> kindness to people throughout the community. So thanks to everyone for their efforts during Kindness Week. Fifth graders in Abby Kobleski's <laughs> class at Pawnee Elementary School were the recipients of 50 books, a gift of the 50 states, 50 books project. The nonprofit organization works to send a box of culturally diverse books and stories to one school or organization in each state. The Pawnee fifth graders are planning on sharing their new collection of books with the first grade students who they mentor every Friday. So congratulations to Pawnee and uh, many thanks to the fifth grade students for the mentoring that they do with the first graders. Three students from Shawnee Mission High Schools have been recognized with National Center for Women and in Information Technology Kansas Affiliate Awards for aspirations in computing. Alice Lovell and Hannah Poe, students at Shawnee Mission South were named honorable mention recipients, and Lauren Dotto, a Shawnee Mission West student, was named an award winner. Honorees are acknowledged for their outstanding aptitude and interest in technology and computing, leadership ability, academic history, and plans for post-secondary education. Congratulations to these students. Bernadette Wagner, Shawnee Mission gymnastics coach, was honored at the 2019 win for Casey Women's Sports Award celebration. Wagner began coaching at Shawnee Mission in 1973. She retired in 2004, but returned in 2006 to serve as assistant coach for her former student, Jenny Turflinger, the head coach of gymnastics for Shawnee Mission South and Shawnee Mission East High Schools. Wagner was presented with the UMB Lifetime Sportswoman Award. Congratulations to her. And now it's time for our Shawnee Mission All-Stars. I'm pleased to welcome Blake Ravel, from Indian Hills Middle School, who will introduce our first Shawnee Mission All-Star honoree this evening. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Good. Now I'm going to start on my actual presentation. Do I stand up and greet Chris Garrett is our first All Means All-Star award winner tonight, and he represents what this award is all about. Chris won't ever be the one who uh, shouts out his own accomplishments, but every day he's willing to put our kids and our staff and the rest of our building first as we meet the needs of kids. 
We frequently hear that there's something different about our school when people walk into Indian Hills. I always double check whether it's that diffusing smell of body spray, like Axe spray that is so common in middle schools, but no, it's not that. Uh, it just feels different in a good way, and it starts with first impressions. Um, our first impression that people have when you walk into school at Indian Hills, um, or any school for that matter, deals with its physical appearance. And Chris Garrett and his team take to heart and do that well. But it goes beyond that. Our educators feel valued. Our staff feels valued. Our students feel valued because they're able to accomplish their work because of Chris and his team, the work that they've completed. We've got a video that exemplifies this commitment to kids, and we're blessed to have Chris as our custodian at IHMS. Please join me in congratulating him. <laughs> Cue the video. I want to let you know that Mr. Chris Garrett is the all-star for all of our classified personnel. That's a really big word. But basically what that means is he's pretty awesome. Let's give him a round of applause. He is a person who is a tireless worker. He comes to school with a great attitude every day, ready to, ready to go. And frankly, I think just the best custodian I've ever worked with. Anytime someone needs something, if there's something that needs to be moved or something that needs to be fixed, we can count on him to be able to do it and do it well. Um, he takes great pride in our building. And I think anybody who comes into our building can see what great pride he takes. It's clean, it's a beautiful space and we appreciate that about him. I ask a lot of Chris, it's like, hey Chris, I know you don't want to hear from me, but, and immediately he responds. I mean, seriously, we are so, so lucky. He's always on a mission to do something, you know, to help even outside since it's been gross weather lately. He has um, went, made sure our, our sidewalks and our roads are cleared off so that we, we don't get injured as employees and things like that. So he's always happy. Um, always looks like he wants to be here, so that's great. We love having him here. Great guy, great work ethic. Really, really thinks about uh, what we're trying to accomplish in uh, operations and maintenance and, and facility management at Indian Hills. What I wanted him to know is that here at Hills, how much he impacts our day to day and how much he makes our day better just by doing the simplest to the most extravagant of tasks. He's a person that when you get to know him, he's about um, developing relationships, not only with staff members, but with kids, and then really trying his very, very best at all situations to get um, what our kids need to be successful. Congrats, Chris. We are so proud of you here at Indian Hills. Way to go, Chris. You really deserve this. Chris, I don't know what we would do without you. I am so happy that you received this award because you deserve it. Thank you for everything you do. You take great care of us and our building, and we appreciate what you do. Thanks. Congratulations, Chris. This is an honor well deserved. Great job, buddy. Chris Garrett, come on up, bud. is for the students. Um, I thank God for getting up every day, being a part of it. Uh, without my crew, I couldn't do what I do. I tell them every day. Um, the teachers are really great. They help us out a lot. Um, O&M, without the guys down there coming and fixing everything they do in our building, uh, it just couldn't stay tip top and keep it operational. Um, and without the uh, administrators bringing in all the support that they do for us, um, we wouldn't be able to carry on. And I really appreciate this award, and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, and congratulations. And now I want to invite Amy Simeonov to introduce the next Shawnee Mission All-Star.
good job on my name, Dr. Fulton. <laughs> it's not an easy one. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Dustin Springer was nominated for the All Means All Star Award by Wanda Boltman, a second grade teacher at Merriam Park. And Dr. Springer serves um, Merriam Park as an instructional coach um, where he supports teachers in their professional growth as well as students in their learning. Um, but Dr. Springer is much more to Merriam Park than an instructional coach. Um, he goes above and beyond every day in every way to support our students, our teachers, our families, and our entire Merriam Park community. Um, we are so lucky to have Dr. Springer as a team member, and we just thank you, Dr. Springer, for all you do for the Merriam Park community. You guys ready to learn huge words? Like, these aren't kindergarten words. These are like... He's an amazing man. <laughs> Mostly the technology, like, if you have a problem with it, you just send it to his office, and then in one second, it's done. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. He, in everything that Dr. Springer does, he shows our students teachers and families how much he cares. From programs that he started, such as Bears to Men and Bear Dens, these specific programs will make an impact on students for the rest of their lives. He teaches us that we have to be uh, responsible, safe, and respectful everywhere we go. Compassion, building relationships, caring, kind. He shows grace, genuine. He is here to serve. There's not just one thing, it's the total package. Dustin and I have mainly been involved with the Marion Park Health Clinic, and um, his vision, his leadership, his ability to connect with community partners, his ability to connect with the staff members, the patrons, he's just done a fabulous job with that project. He probably puts in more hours than any of us. Um, he's probably the first here, last to leave. He's always involved in our after-school community events. We just came in one morning and there were these three by five cards that he had made for every child in our building and for every staff member in our building. And we were asked to affix them to their desk so that every day they would see that they were special. I was a new student and I barely had any friends. I met some friends and then when I got in safety patrol and there's the men I met even more. And overall, he's just been really great to me. I cannot think of a more deserving candidate for this award. Um, you've not only made an impact at Merriam Park, but you're making an impact all over the district and we appreciate you so much. Congratulations a lot. Um, great job. <laughs> Dr. Springer, come on up. Good evening. Thank you. Um, it's really humbling to be here tonight um, and to be recognized for something that comes from my heart. Um, you know, I, I came to the Shawnee Mission School District three years ago and um, really was welcomed into the Merriam Park family and it, it completely changed my life. Um, sorry, that's the first time I'd seen that video. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do at Merriam Park without our amazing staff. Um, without the love and support of my parents and my wife and, and children who came tonight, Hunter, Helen, and Dalton. Um, but our, our staff has really, um, has really embraced me. You know, last, last year, um, Jane Quinn, who's the former director of the National Center for Community Schools, came and spoke to our, our school about the work that we were doing, and she said something that really stood out to me. Um, and that is, no matter what we do, whatever it is that we're doing, we have to have the word yes in our hearts. And when I come to Marion Park every morning, 
I, I look into the eyes of our kids and I see the smiles and I look to my left and I look to my right and I see our staff and they have the word yes in their hearts and it just is an amazing place to be. So the staff that came tonight and the staff that um, we'll see this tomorrow because I'm going to show them. Um, <laughs> I want you to know how much I love you and appreciate everything that you do and thank you for leading with your hearts and allowing me to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to all of our honorees and recipients of awards tonight. It's what a fun evening. Well, later in the agenda, we have two leaders who have announced their respective retirements after the 2019-2020 school year. And I want to honor them here for a moment. Dr. Ed Strike, Chief of Student Services, and John Douglas, Executive Director of Emergency Services, have each announced their decision to retire effective June 30 of 2020. As system leaders concerned with the long-term success of the district, each of them decided to announce their decision now in order to provide the board and administration with maximum flexibility and planning for the future. And we've been doing a lot of planning around uh, addressing a million dollar uh, reduction in funds in Title I and also working to make sure that we appropriately address the uh, deficit spending that we went into this year. And uh, they've been part of that problem solution team. So I want to recognize each of them. I asked them if they wanted to say anything. They said, no, it's way too early. Like they're not, it's June of 2020 before they retire. So, but I just want to acknowledge both of them and thank them tonight. So just as a reminder, at the last meeting, we, uh, we talked about the, the Title I uh, reduction in funding that the district is receiving and that we were gonna reduce the number of Title I schools from 14 schools to eight next year. There are seven certified and classified staff impacted by that. The good news is, is all seven will be assigned to appropriate positions, some of them uh, in their current schools, and, uh, or to another school in the district if schools in their, if placements in their current school are not available. Also, the instructional coaches at each of the six impacted schools will remain with uh, their salaries absorbed in the operating budget. We will also shift all social workers from being funded by, uh, by title monies into the operating budget so we can maintain those positions. That's about $680,000 in cost that we'll have to cover in the operating budget going forward. And our, our goal is to, uh, to do this through reorganization and attrition. The administrative retirements that we've been announcing will help uh, in achieving that goal. Details of the plan, which we'd hope to have Completely ready and I are not quite ready, but by the next board meeting, I can assure you we'll have all the, the details laid out. There's a lot of uh, just thinking that we have to do in terms of the best way to do that and be respectful to folks. Um, so we'll have that ready at our next meeting. Also, as an additional my, reminder, and I'm, we have some folks who are gonna talk about this tonight. I'm glad you're here, thank you for coming. Uh, we're proactively addressing needs for staff training and diversity and inclusion We've talked about the fact that uh, there's research going on and, and this body of research contributes to that on developing a training model for all staff that we can begin next year in diversity and inclusion. Dr. McKinney and Linda Seek have been uh, working on helping to head that up. We're looking at cost structures and so on because whatever structure we develop, it has to uh, sustain over a long period of time. We have 4,000 staff, that's a lot of people so we need a model that will work and is affordable. Uh, we're also adding an in-house counsel in a way that's cost neutral. We already pay money for attorneys. We're gonna be able to go with an in-house counsel and not spend more. Our goal would be to save money, but at the very least break even based on current expenditures. And then also, as we've begun to look at the budget through reorganization, begin to look at ways that we can provide additional support through a coordinator role to help with training with diversity and that would sit under the guidance of Dr. McKinney. It's gonna take a team approach over a long period of time and we're committed to doing that. These are important first steps in supporting all learners 
you know, both their academic and social emotional success. And so we have some work to do. We're going to do that work. We're going to come in with a, a budget that works. And we're going to try to do it in a way that really prioritizes students and their learning. So thank you very much. And that's, that concludes my report. OK, and then item 2.2, .2, we go back to you for the strategic planning update. OK, we do have uh, some exciting things going on strategic planning. The steering committee is now formed, and it reflects our community. While we have far more volunteers and we have uh, spaces for on the committee, there will be future opportunities for involvement through action planning teams and site councils. We met Tuesday, February 5th with the site councils, steering committee members, and uh, PTA officer representatives. Approximately 200 people, 250 people attended, which was great because this is a bad weather night. And that a pre presentation is available online. As a reminder, the strategic planning steering committee members have an important responsibility of working on behalf of over 27,000 over 27,000 students that we serve. Each brings their own insights and perspectives. Each will be challenged to think deeply and broadly about the needs of all learners and resist the temptation or perhaps even the pressure to represent a specific constituency or set of ideas. Uh, they're there on behalf of all children. And at the end of the day, we have to have a plan that does in fact prepare all students for their future. The next step for the steering committee is to meet February 21 to 23. They will develop, and you can see this on the screen, the beliefs, the mission, the, uh, the objectives, and some of the strategies. That's the big picture of the work, but the details of the work really happen with the action planning teams. Those will, those will be formed and involve a lot of people, so some of the folks that maybe want to be on the steering committee, but weren't able to get on it, will absolutely be able to get involved in the action planning teams. An important contributing document that will help guide this work is a community profile. That will be available to the steering committee members prior to them starting the work, and we'll also post that online for all patrons to see. The document will include themes from our district climate survey, which we recently did, and Thought Exchange, which is currently out there and active. And as an update on Thought Exchange, as of early this morning, uh, there have been 1,179 participants with 1,237 thoughts and 24,000 ratings. And that number is going up, well, it was going up by the minute as we were watching it. So that's, that's an old number already. Thought Exchange closes February 15th. And the question that's on Thought Exchange is the next slide. That's okay. That's okay. It's, there you go talking about this very big qu picture question of where the skills that are current first graders, that's a class of 2030, what do they need in order to be successful ready graduates? And so uh, we'll look forward to seeing what the themes are from Thought Exchange as well as our climate surveys, combined with all the data that we're going to provide in the community profile, and that will form a, an important uh, factual foundation for our work. And uh, that concludes that part of the report. Thanks. And uh, now we're moving on to board member reports. Um, Ms. Laura Guy with SMAC PTA. I have no reports. Okay. Um, and then I'm up next with SMEF, and I also do not have a report from SMEF this, this meeting. Um, and Ms. Zila is absent this evening. She's not well, so she's not giving us a report. Um, Dr. Sinclair, do you have a report from KSB Legislative and Government Network? Um, it, it's more of a um, of an observation or comment, the KASB advocacy team has been um, uh, hard at work kind of implementing the legislative platform of the members of the KASB, which reflect our, kind of in parallel, our legislative platform as well. So they've been testifying and advocating on behalf of our public schools. First and foremost, with in relation to our school finance formula. Let's get that passed and move forward. Sounds good. <laughs> Okay, and then um, Ms. Goodburn with the KSB Nominating Committee and Constituent Services Task Force. Um, nominating's done. Okay. Um, and Constituent Task Force, we were supposed to meet last week, but we're derailed by the bad weather. So we've got another date uh, coming up soon. Okay, um, and then we are now moving on to the board comment, or the public comment period. 
2.04. And so I'm just going to review some of the policy with regards to public comment because we do have some speakers this evening. Um, a time for public comment occurs at all our regularly scheduled Board of Education meetings. If you're a member of the public and want to address the board during public comment, you fill out an information card prior to the meeting and check in usually about 10 minutes before around 5.50. Um, each speaker is granted three minutes. There will be a timer on the clock to watch for those three minutes. Um, proceed to the podium when your name is called, shared your name and your city of residency um, and the group or organization you're representing if you're representing. Um, written comments and materials are accepted by the board of the clerk board, the clerk of the board for distribution. Um, make your comments from behind the podium and generally responses from board members during the public comment period are limited to clarifying questions. So there's usually not much of a response from the dais in that regard. Um, and I will go ahead and get started in reading off our names for public comment tonight. Um, first, we have Etienne Klatanoff. I'm hoping I pronounced that. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Hi. My name is E.T.N. Klatnoff. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read some notes because I was busy today, so I apologize for not looking up the whole time. Um, my name is E.T.N. Klatnoff. I'm a current Belinder um, parent to a fourth grader. I'm here representing the Shawnee Mission East Di Diversity and Inclusion Group, which was, which was formulated by a group of concerned parents four years ago on the topic of the lack of diversity and equality within the district. This committee's goal is for the district to adopt and implement a strategic diversity and inclusion plan in order to provide a positive and safe environment for all Shawnee Mission District students. The recommendations are to implement a strategy to address the issues of diversity and greater inclusion of the unrepresented groups. We as a district can do this by one, cultivating a board administration and faculty that reflect our current student demographics, uh, require diversity training for all employees of the district, and I did hear you um, address that this evening. Uh, three, close the achievement gap. Four, develop an equity scorecard to collect data highlighting discipline, college, career readiness, climate and cultural and literacy. And finally, developing a diversity office, which would be comprised of a director of equity and inclusion, director of multilingual education, advisory council, and student team. These will allow the district to reduce the exposure to liability from investigations, negative public relations, lawsuits, and most of all, provide a safe environment for all Shiny Mission students to thrive. Uh, currently, the, this group has presented these recommendations at least four times to cabinet members and um, interim superintendent and current superintendent in the past year and a half. Um, on a personal comment, um, my family is uh, multicultural, interracial, and biracial. And the key terms there that you probably hear are two and multiple. And so as a person living in that world, often as a kid, I felt like I was bouncing in between two worlds, and usually two worlds that didn't understand each other very well. Um, I see my kids going through the same thing that have already identified concerns at age nine and three of things that are, shouldn't be the way they are in this world concerning who they are and accepting who they are um, and why people treat them a certain way. Um, I'm asking the district to implement this type of plan so my kids um, who are going to be in this district throughout their educational career um, can actually feel like they're in an environment where they can learn and that people understand the worlds that they're coming from and they don't constantly have to defend or feel like they're bounced between two worlds that don't, don't get each other. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Miss Anisha Jackson. Good evening. My name is Anisha Jackson. I live in Lenexa, Kansas. My child attends Shawnee Mission West. I'm a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, Shawnee Mission West Site Council, board president for MTKC Music Theater, Kansas City, board member of Spinning Tree Theater, and supporter of many diversity organizations across the country. On behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, I am here to share with you some data from our plan that supports our proposal, Climate Survey, article headlines, and recommendations for the district to hire a diversity and inclusion district officer. 
I would like to begin by stating our district has an achievement gap that particularly affects our submarginal groups, particularly African Americans. Dr. Fulton shared with us last week during the strategic planning meeting, uh, the focus for the district is to have a 90% graduation rate. That is essentially the achievement gap that we're working towards. On his slide, he illustrated many subgroups with the lowest uh, rate being around 67% for the African American group compared to the rest of the subgroups. The African American subgroup by far was the lowest on the charts. Our proposal also looks at the district's data and what percentage of the district's admin and staff reflect the actual demographics showing the subgroups increasing but not reflecting in the staffing in the district as Etsy mentioned earlier. The Kansas assessment results from 2017 highlight subgroups not performing well in comparison to our white subgroups with African American and Hispanic subgroups in the bottom tiers. ACT performance at Shawnee Mission East data in 2017 excuse me, from 2013 through 2017, show that African-American ACT scores, on average, never made it past the score of a 20 and started trending downward starting in 2017. My daughter was not able to be here tonight, so I'm saying, uh, presenting on her behalf, a climate survey that she's conducting right now at Shawnee Mission West. She created the survey this summer, working with the Multicultural Leadership Club at Shawnee Mission West, and her goal was to collect the data from the student's perspective relative to school climate and propose solutions to close the gaps they identify and turn it into a working strategic plan to help all students and contribute to the overall strategic plan for the district. Recent headlines and community conversations illustrate the need for change. Lastly, I leave you with a few articles, headlines, that all support the need for the district to hire a diversity and inclusion officer and address the current climate. March 2015, I2M East, an Instagram campaign by Sean Mission East students to display comments they've heard because of their race. October 2017, district needs to work to attract more minority teachers, Shawnee Mission Post. April 20th, 2017, Shawnee Mission School District hears from the ACLU about a child's alleged ICE-related arrests. These are just a few headlines to further demonstrate the need for our district to hire a diversity and inclusion officer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Ms. Debbie Williams. Good evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to have us here tonight. I address you in my capacity as a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, but probably more importantly, as the parent of two African American men who graduated from Shawnee Mission East. My sons benefited from all kinds of excellence given in the education here. They were members of jazz band, track. Uh, one of them, uh, received the Silver Latin Award. They benefited from art and more. But after they left the district, I realized that the district may be in danger of fixating on its past reputation of excellence. And because this, this district is so lovely and so excellent, we are capable of even more. We can be greater still and yet more excellent. And as I came in this room, I remember one of the last times I was here was when the superintendent candidates were making their speeches to the public. And I heard a candidate who talked about uh, producing proficient learners, responsible citizens, and college and career ready students. And I stand here to tell you I believe the diversity and inclusion plan that this group has put together will help this district do that. And I am so proud to be a member of a group that will stand side by side with the candidate who said that is how he wanted our district to turn out. And I just ask this school board to stand with him and stand with us and stand with the students of Shawnee Mission Schools to ensure that our students go confidently um, equipped into college and career when they graduate from this district so they will hopefully return to us and make this world and this community greater still and yet more excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Ms. Kelly Brenda or Brenda.
Good evening. My name is Kelly Brendy, and I have three students. My husband and I have three students in the district. We have a sixth grader at Corinth Elementary. We have a senior at East and a sophomore at East. We all saw the headlines recently from Blue Valley. Um, I suffered a brain injury uh, about six years ago, so I haven't been able to be involved in a lot of different things that are happening at the district level. Before that happened, I was um, president of the Corinth Education Foundation, um, president uh, for several years of that organization and planned to be very involved. Unfortunately, I was not able to join the um, diversity inclusion committee that formed at East, even though I really wanted to be part of that. But with the recent headlines, I had to do something. I read those articles and I read the articles that were mentioned earlier by other people um, and it just breaks my heart that people in our district, in our city, in our community, in our state, in our nation, are dealing with these issues. And I approached Bernie and my friend Aaron Woods and what can I do to help this because I can't sit on the sidelines anymore. Our district needs to stand up and do something. So my friend Aaron Woods and I, what we decided to do is we were gonna get, we were gonna help um, by showing the um, support in the community, community for the Diversity Inclusion Committee. Aaron and I wrote a letter and published it about a week ago to some um, friends and went out. And in a week's time, we have over 300 signatures of people from this community saying that it's so important for us to, us as a district, to do something about diversity and inclusion and equity. I really enjoyed your comments today and I know that we're taking first steps, but we need to do more. There's so much that has to be done, but I know we have to take steps to do it. And the letter that, I wanna read you a few parts of the letter in the time I have remaining. Um, so you can get a feel for that. And I do have copies here. I'm not sure how to get those to you. Um, and I also will send you electronic copies of that. And this is addressed to, to the Board of Education. It is time for the Shawnee Mission School District to take a proactive approach to ensure that all students in our district have an inc have inclusive and safe learning environment. Shawnee Mission School District has excellent teachers, hardworking staff, and an overall welcoming community. But recent events in our neighborhood, neighboring school districts and some incidents in our own district make it naive to believe that those are the only issues experienced by students in our district. We can and should do more to ensure that all SMSD students experience a learning environment that is inclusive and respectful to students and staff. To that end, we urge the Shawnee Mission School District Board of Education to take immediate action in creating an equity inclusion plan for our district. We go through some more information there, but what, I wanna read you the, the seven things that we um, have in the letter that is supported by th over 300 people through our district, in including teachers, um, parents, community members, students. You'll see the whole list and how diverse that is. Um, these are the few of the st strategies that um, were included in the recommendations that have been given to the board, but I wanna read these that were, um, I'm out of time. I will give you these, but they are the recommendations that you have seen before. But we just felt that we need to show you that it's more than just the people of the committee who've been before you for the last four, four years. In a week's time, we were able to get 300 sig or over 300 signatures to show support for this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Adam Finkelston. Pardon me while I read. Uh, my name is Adam Finkelston. I have two students in Shawnee Mission School District at Westwood View and at Indian Hills. And I also teach at Shawnee Mission East. And I'm here on behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Group. Uh, thank you for allowing me to address you today. As an SMSD alumnus, parent, and employee, I'm very happy to see my district taking proactive steps to cultivate an open dialogue about equity and inclusion in our schools. I want to speak specifically to how I hope this committee can help teachers and also how I think teachers can help the committee. One thing the committee can do for teachers is to provide opportunities to learn about minority and, and marginalized groups to learn how we might serve them more effectively. A couple of years ago at Shawnee Mission East, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee set up panel discussions with student, parent, and community leaders in the African American, Latino, and LGBTQ communities to discuss their experiences in Shawnee Mission School District. It was extremely instructive for me to have the opportunity to listen and ask questions to understand what I might do as a teacher to communicate with those students more effectively. I teach in the visual arts department at Shawnee Mission East, and I'd like to suggest that the arts is another powerful way that we can reach students who come from diverse backgrounds uh, and have diverse experiences. The arts provide a powerful way for students to tell their stories. 
We're able to do this in our classrooms and our hallways, but we believe these stories need a bigger audience. Through partnerships with Interurban Art House, for example, we've been able to put on public exhibitions of student work that enable students to tell their stories to a wider audience. These programs also put our students in touch with professional artists who have similar stories to tell. I think the committee can help us by sponsoring and fostering relationships like the one that we have had with Interurban Art House and also actively seek other programs that offer students similar opportunities in other curricular areas. These programs not only foster equity and inclusion, but they also offer internships, mentorships, and professional opportunities that can benefit students after they leave our district. For our part, I think teachers can be deliberate about showing multiple perspectives by including different voices and different faces in their lesson planning. Teachers can guide discussions that encourage equal weight to all students' voices, and the committee can provide opportunities for teachers to learn how to do that more effectively. Most importantly, I think teachers can listen to their students, be mentors, encourage them, and support them. Teachers, parents, and the entire community have a stake in the success of our students. I'm hopeful that we are working towards a school district that anticipates what students need going forward to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Janet Williams. Good evening. Um, my name is Janet Williams, and I am, it's kind of weird having my back to you guys, sorry. Um, I'm the mom of two um, young women at Shawnee Mission East High School. And one of the um, things that Etienne mentioned is living in two worlds, and, and that's where we live because my daughters are African American. And um, I have, they've been um, my children for more than 16 years. And even with an MSW and a PhD in education, I thought that I got it, and I don't. And I'm here to say, um, that we really need immediately a path of escalation within every school in the district when they come home and tell me of the microaggressions that they experience almost on a daily basis, even from their closest friends, we don't know who to turn to. We don't know who to go to, we don't know who to reach out to, um, and we need to know who gets it. And I am all in favor of a strategic plan, but I would urge you to do something before then. Um, I'm doing that on a very personal level because my kids are freshmen and juniors. Who do they go to? How do I get them through school? Um, if it's happening to them when they have a mom who is not afraid to speak up, what's happening to the other kids? And what happens when um, someone says something hateful to somebody? Where do they go? Who do they reach out to? Um, time and time again, they've been told um, that didn't really happen, or it is just really, really diminished. Um, I've had people say to me, well, you knew what you were getting into picking Shawnee Mission East. You knew what you were getting into in this district. They're privileged to go to school here. I've actually had that said to, this is a white school. Why are you here? Um, and we really need to take care of that. And, and I just urge you um, to take a hard look at it. I love the idea of strategic planning. We already know what the research says. We know about um, high, uh, suspension rates for kids of color. And while you can look at that and say, oh yeah, it's happening here, we know it's happening here. So I am just urging you and begging you at this point to please step up and do something now. We, you need to show the families of color in this district that you support them. And the first thing that you can do is put together a div diversity or equity and inclusion office, not one part of you know, a five-part job, um, not simply training, but what's the escalation path? Who do they go to? Who do they go to at the district level? And what's the plan? We have a great bullying hot hotline. Everybody can call in on that. What happens for the kids of color or um, the marginalized groups when something happens to them within the building? And who's there for them? And, and that's what I'm asking, is someone to be there for our kids. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone who came out tonight to speak. It's not easy speaking in front of a group. I know you're doing it for your kids and for the district, and your time and your effort is appreciated. So thank you for coming. Um, and now we're going to move on to the um, discussion items for this evening. And the first is an update on the food service plan. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for asking me to come back and give you an update. 
I wanted to share with you where we're at with the after school snack and meal program. We have 17 schools that are eligible and 16 are participating. Well, that's great news. Yeah, it's the best we've done in five years. So it's very good. So thank you for all your help and support. Um, I think that just this slide kind of speaks for itself. So we've done a really good job. Uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the negative account balances. We continue to monitor this data very carefully. I provide uh, Dr. Atha this information on a weekly basis. And as you can see, as of last week, approximately $13,219 of the $16,554 in negative account balances are attributed to families who do not qualify for free and reduced. And in looking at the data as well, I found that approximately $2,000 is attributed to middle school students, $2,000 to high school students, and the balance is to elementary school students. I also wanted to share, we have had a patron uh, that has been um, wonderful to food service for the last eight years and has contributed, he and his wife, about $23,000 to help pay for students meals that just couldn't afford them. He reached out to me about two weeks ago and asked where we were with this process. And in our discussion, he said, yes, I could bring this up to you tonight, but also wanted me to share with you that he and his wife are not comfortable with this current process that we're doing. So they will be reevaluating their donations going forward. So he wanted me to share that with you. So do you have any questions or? things on this slide before we go to the next. Can, can you share specifically what their concerns are or is that, was that a private conversation? It was a private conversation. Thank you. What it, one point of clarification on the, in the middle column, students approved for free that have negative balances. Explain a little bit about how a student approved for free can have a negative balance. Uh, many times parents do not um, either um, submit the paperwork right away and uh, so thus they get uh, charged full price and then we call them, we talk with them and recommend that they might try to qualify. Then they do get qualified and then they get free from the time they are approved. So this is money that they have uh, charged up until that point of time. And this is normative? Excuse There's me? A, this is normative? There's a period of time in which we're working with families to help them realize that yes. there are resources they can yes. access? Yes. And we it make, takes a while to get them approved, and then once they're approved, then what happens to the negative balances that they were incurring? Are those, um, those we, we work with them. We encourage them to give us even like a dollar a week, whatever they can afford. Um, we have had over this last year, and I have not tracked uh, the donations, but you will see um, peaks and valleys in the total negative balances, and you'll see that around the holidays. We did receive some phone calls from both building principals and from outside patrons that were donating money to this cause. So that's why it kind of peaks and valleys. And, and I bring that up because obviously there's about 23, for example, on, on February 7th, there's about $2,300 in here that's normative mm -hmm. as we're working with families. Is mm -hmm. the remainder of it? Mm -hmm. with, and those involve students mostly. I assume there could be some students that should be qualifying that aren't that are right and we don't know that right but we don't know exactly what, how many students that would involve but we do know there's a number of families who are full pay lunch who will remain full pay lunch mm -hmm. uh, and those that's the group we're really saying look we really need you to come forward and right pick up your negative mm -hmm. balance mm -hmm. i just want to clarify that for the board and so dr fulton i think you said 2300 you mean 3300 to put the 1,900. Yes, thank you for okay. correcting my math. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, no, and, it is 3,300. Okay, thank, thank you. And for point of reference, once a, a family submits an application and we receive it, that application is either approved or denied within 24 hours. Federal law allows us to give them um, 10 days. We don't believe that that's appropriate, so we do that within 24 hours. So we're trying to get them approved as quickly as humanly possible. So to look in at these numbers, and I haven't had a, a long time to study these. How did we go from December 21st, and we have 17,000, 
and then we went pop down to 14,000. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting to me that it, it That's the holiday makes, time that donations. we got donations. But what I'm, so that's the donation, mm -hmm. and then it pops back up, mm -hmm. and it looks like it's about $500,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, that's what mm -hmm. the increments There are. is no logic to this. That's yeah. what's amazing. There's no pattern. Mm -mm. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's just been kind of an interesting thing to watch. It really okay. has been. Now, the next slide. Um, as you know, we have always done automated um, notifications to families with low account balances and negative account balances. But you, as the board had requested, we do a little bit of personalization, so we've made phone calls. So we st made phone calls to parents with negative $20 on their accounts until it got to the point that it was just taking an exorbitant amount of time, and then we switched over to negative $40. So that's the number of families that have been contacted each Monday, and then those families, the number that were called previously. What we're trying to explain to them, were you aware that you owed money? May we help you get through the application process for free and reduced? What can we help you with through that whole process? Um, we're just a resource. We're just trying to help them as much as we can. So. Um, I have a question. I know that we don't track data on what parents' jobs are, but with the furloughed employees mm -hmm. recently, I know mm -hmm. there's 10, 000, there were 10,000 mm -hmm. federal furloughed employees in the Kansas City metropolitan area, but I don't know how that plays out for Well, what we did was us. I reached out to Dr. McKinney, and then he reached out to all his social workers, and we put the word out that please apply because you could because you have no income. Because they could qualify they, without having well, the income? Well, potentially, because if a spouse has income, they may not. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the household income. But we put the word out. And we did get um, numerous calls from um, families, and we explained the process. And we said, yes, please apply. You have no income right now. OK. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sarah, yes. In previous years, remind me of the amount, the total amount that we had negative. We would run roughly 4,500 in negative dollars. And so that was what the donations would cover. Basically, the 4,500 were more of the, these negative balances, potentially of free and reduced and um, or free and reduced. That was to cover that. Well, balance, it would cover all of that because remember we allowed um, elementary students to charge three times, and middle school students to charge once, and high school students were not allowed to charge. Right. So was the bulk of that 4,500 really in this realm right here of the ne the free and reduced that that it was across it was between? across the board it really was okay yeah. it wasn't the mm -mm. the majority of mm -mm. it so we would try to pay off all the negative account balances if we could if we couldn't we tried to pay off um, the sixth graders going into junior high and then the um, eighth graders going into ninth grade hoping that they would start their next educational experience with um, zero negative accounts. Ms. Mack. Um, just a follow up on the donations at Christmas, uh, in December. Uh huh. Um, how is it determined who gets to benefit from those donations? Is it, is it students that are free and reduced? Are those the people that It benefit? depends on who calls, and we ask them where would they like their money oh, to go. Where would they like the donation mm -hmm. to go? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you for mm -hmm. clarifying that. And if it's a building principal that has some donations, we ask him or her what they prefer. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sinclair. Uh, do you have a sense of whether these, uh, looking in that total negative balance, kind of that first column, whether these are um, new students participating in the lunch, you know, the meal program? Are we having more students eating lunch, or is it just a shift in, in payment among those who've already been participating in school lunches? Is that something you can tell? About? I would say about two weeks ago, we saw several additional families get approved for free meals that are not normally approved. This time of year is usually pretty quiet in my office. We don't get a lot of inquiries. So that was kind of a shift in abnormality, for lack of a better word, which we were pleased to help those families. Okay. Um, but So I was just curious if we just had a, a number of, fam of kids out there who just weren't eating. Um, and now have the opportunity to, but there's a payment gap. Does that make sense? Right. I understand what you're asking, but I can't answer that okay. question. I'm sorry. No, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Reverend Guy? 
My memory is that the board said we were going to revisit this again in April to make a decision whether mm -hmm. we could continue this. And we agreed that it had to be cost neutral, um, that we couldn't go into debt with our lunch program. Um, and so we encouraged the community to help us on this. The, at the time, we said that we didn't like the former practice of having to give a child a cheese sandwich and milk. We didn't think that was enough food for that child, for fuel, for the rest of the school day. Well, we had all the right reasons for doing this. And, um, and so I just, I want to encourage teachers and parents and the community to help us. We don't want to have to reverse this decision in April, but we have got to find a way um, to make this cost neutral. Mm -hmm. And so if you're aware of families that would qualify for free and reduced lunch and they just haven't filled out the paperwork, please, please encourage them to do that. I have heard so many positive things from um, people who work in food service and the teachers that say it's so wonderful now to be in the cafeteria and to know that every child is going to get a school lunch, whether they have money in their account or not. That's a good thing and we want to continue that practice, but we're going to need help from the public right. to be able to continue right. this. Um, so please work with us and help us so that we can continue this. We have two months to kind of figure this out. And I would tag on if there are people that are interested in making a donation just to call me directly in the food service office and I'll uh, walk them through the process. They can designate a particular school. They can set their own parameters. May, do we have any community partnerships? I know some of the local churches collect snacks that are distributed in certain buildings. Do we have any community partnerships with partners who are interested in assisting with this that we're aware of at this Not time? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, mm -mm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and up next, um, we have uh, Stuart Little with the legislative update on what's happening in Topeka. Oh, don't leave now, folks. <laughs> <laughs> It happens all the time. <laughs> <clears throat> you should see my house. This is what happens when I start to open my mouth as well. Uh, good evening. I'm Stuart Little with Little Government Relations in Topeka. I'm going to give you guys a brief update. You should have a written report that I provided. and It'll get up on the website uh, probably tomorrow, I guess. I want to thank the board, uh, Dr. Fulton, and your, uh, the administration for their efforts. We've been getting busier this week as we get into the fifth week of the legislative session. And I'm going to hit a couple of big picture highlights, talk about some specific uh, legislative policy issues, and be happy to answer any questions. Um, we have a couple of things going on that are um, contributing to how we're going to deal with school finance this year. The, um, the first thing was that the Senate last week passed out a, a payment of a CAPERS payment, $115 million, which is the Public Employees Retirement that uh, including teachers and it was a payment that had not been paid for the last two years and it was money that was owed that payment was made by the the senate it was not in the governor's budget second item i would point out is senate bill 22 which is the windfall tax bill which uh, provides tax uh, returns money to taxpayers or provides a tax break for corporations and individuals based on the changes in federal tax policy that, that happened in 20, uh, 2017. Making those changes here in Kansas has an impact on revenue that are collected. And so that bill passed the Senate on a vote of 26 to 14, and it is now over in the House, and they'll start hearing it next week. It has a cost of $194 million taken out in the first year of, of anticipated revenue, and then about $115 million per year thereafter. So if you take a step back now, when I first talked, came back and came and talked, we had a budget, uh, at the, uh, a revenue surplus of about $90 million or $900 million at the end of this year in which we would have the opportunity to address the Gannon Supreme Court and a variety of other things. The governor spent some of that money, some of that money included in her bill, the re-amortization of of the long-range CAPERS payments, uh, but most importantly, had not spent these two chunks of money. So we've got, in these two bills that have passed the Senate, one-third of the revenue that was anticipated to have as an ending balance has been allocated by the Senate. We'll have to see how the House handles that. Uh, also, we had in January 50-some-odd million dollars of revenue below estimates. So we're kind of working our way down in terms of revenue that's available. So as we, I, we start, you start watching things happen in Topeka, 
Uh, don't, don't be surprised to see money being spent, unlike we have seen in the last few years, because there are uh, interest in, in, in spending money. Nobody was complaining about making a CAPERS payment. That was part of what is required, and that benefits teachers and all public employees. But also, there's, there's, there's um, the less money that's, that's on the table at the end of the session, the harder it is to come up, to mon come up with resources for school finance and Medicaid expansion, probably the two largest policy issues that are in front of the legislature. So there are those, those kinds of factors are something that to, to keep in mind. Now, we're going to have a variety of bills, and I've, in, I've included in kind of the big picture summary a couple of the other bills, uh, weapons, uh, discrimination, gender identity, sexual orientation bills, so having a going to maybe have an active conversation about that this year uh, uh, that we haven't in a while. Um, but the one thing that is not happening is we're not necessarily moving toward a resolution of the Gannon decision and coming up with something to send to the Supreme Court. We're uh, we're about three weeks away, or not about, we're less than three weeks now away from the end of the first half of the legislative session, and so we're going to have about two weeks of committee work, one week on the floor, take a break, and then come back and work for about six more weeks, and then we'll essentially be done with the regular legislative session. And so a lot of things have to happen in the next couple of weeks. The CAPERS bill will likely, that payment bill will likely move in the House. The tax bill will likely move in the House. The CAPERS bill will pass in the House. That's, a, that's just a given, pretty much. The tax bill is going to be close. There's going to be lots of conversations that happen about that. Uh, today, when they began to talk about it in House Tax Committee, they introduced a bill also to begin stepping down the sales tax on food. So that may be part of the package if we're going to give a tax break to corporations and to individuals. We should also have sales tax on food in that. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Um, but there's going to be a lot of things happen in the next three weeks, and, and uh, we've, and Dr. Fulton has already figured out that we email each other all the time to make sure everybody knows what's going on and where things are. Um, when I talk about education specific, the Governor's School Finance Plan, I've summarized that in my previous reports, and I'm leaving it in my report because it's kind of the base that we're building from as we go forward. But it's all in one bill, Senate Bill 44 in the Senate Education Committee. There's another uh, comparable, uh, uh, the same bill in the House K-12 Education Budget Committee. And um, the Senate has begun having their hearings. Last Wednesday, they began hearing Senate Bill 44, and they'll follow up tomorrow with continuation of those hearings. And the bill, there was, uh, you, those, some of you were present, we had a, uh, the, the delegation meeting there, and they've been talking about this is essentially the bill that adds $90 million a year for the next four years to fund the inflation factor. You could get a sense from the questions in the Q&A that happened in that hearing that there are there's some interest in, in is this inflation factor correct or not, what else needs to be done, why are we doing it this way, those kinds of things. Um, that bill is going to, um, to eventually probably work its way out of that committee and get to the House floor. I don't know what it will look like. I don't know how much money is going to be in there. Uh, but there was some, converse, some recognition that an inflation factor needs to be added, some questions about what, how big should that be, what should it be, uh, are, I think are going to shape a bit of what the Senate committee uh, passes out as a bill. On the House side, I will tell you, <clears throat> that the plan is a little less uh, clear. If, so if it sounded like the Senate plan wasn't clear, the House plan may be a little even less clear than that. But they are essentially uh, have not begun to tackle the school finance bill. They have a tremendous number of new people on their committee. I think it's maybe six out of 21. And so they are... They are working their way through a, 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 an education in, the, in how the school finance issues. They're, they're also beginning to break them up into topic issues, like we're have, beginning to have conversations about what is an at-risk child. Some of you that have been around have, you know, when you start delving into is there, are there better other different ways to, to, to uh, qualify for at-risk and what should we do? We're headed down that path now for a while. So that's going to make it uh, e even more interesting. Um, what I will what I will say is that um, I'm not sure that either one of these uh, committees are going to accomplish the main goal, which is the briefs in the Gannon decision are due in in April and or in March, and then the uh, the Attorney General issued a letter to the 
to the legislature that if they were simply going to add the $90 million as the court anticipated, they needed to have something to the, the Supreme Court by the 15th of March, which means passing two chambers and signed by the governor, which doesn't happen quickly most of the time. But if they did want to make changes to what, and, and not just fund inflation, then the, the attorney general who was representing the state and needs to prepare briefs and prepare the oral arguments needed to know by March 1st, those deadlines will not be met. And so that's going to begin to kind of raise the issue of how are you going to, what are, how and what is going to be pre prepared for legal briefs if there's not a school finance bill that has passed both chambers and is at the, the governor's desk. So um, the, there's a lot of conversation going on, but I, I think if you're watching what happened in the Senate committee, there's not a bill ready to pass out of there and the House has not begun to hear a bill. So we're still a long way from getting this res resolved. I mentioned a couple of issues that have popped up in, just in terms of legislation and policy uh, separate from school finance. Uh, and, and, and there are a few things that are, that are, 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 are interesting and are gonna get some hearing time as we get into, because most bills have to pass the original chamber by the turnaround period, by the 28th, so we're gonna be in a real crunch. Um, a bill to kind of specify the, uh, the school safety uh, drill requirements and clarify that. We just had a hearing on that this morning, the fire marshal this afternoon, fire marshal testified and gonna, instead of having some places 16 drills, we're gonna try to come down to nine and suggest that as a model for how things are done. Um, there's going to be a hearing on a financial literacy bill that would become a graduation requirement. Uh, those of you that have been here before, we've done this bill maybe four or five times before, and it ended up putting in into statute that financial literacy had to be a component of the education process, but one of those one of those items. But this would make it a course requirement for graduation. Um, there's also a bill that we'll get a hearing on Thursday of this week that w is uh, called the Hope Scholarship Act, which would create um, for a student in a in a public school who was a, a victim of, of bullying would be able to get a, a voucher to take to a private school uh, along with a, 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 a transportation cost. You'd essentially be able to take what your school received uh, as your base funding uh, and take that to uh, and get a voucher to go to a private school. And there'll be a hearing on that bill on Friday. So things like financial literacy and this, this voucher bill are, uh, are kind of what the House is fo focusing their attention on. Um, there are a, a, a couple of other hearings um, um, that, that you can read about in the report, but I probably have given you kind of nothing but not great news at this point. So I'll pause and see if there are any questions. Dr. Sinclair? Um, I have a couple so I can stop and Thank you, Stuart. Um, uh, so on the CAPERS payment bill, that $115 million, that's the one you had mentioned that will likely, you thought there might be a likelihood that that would get passed in the House. There's a, another CAPERS bill, right, the whole reamortization. That's a separate piece. Yes, this and is. And you weren't referring to that. I was not. I was referring okay. to this bill. This was a bill that was simply put together to say we didn't make this CAPERS payment last year that was owed um, and this would make that payment. The amortization bill has a hearing tomorrow or the day after and we'll begin, maybe I think it's Wednesday, be going through that, which was the governor's proposal to uh, extend the, the projections for actuarial, whatever you call that, where you reach that point of well-funded uh, and it would extend that by about t uh, 10 years and um, but would generate about $140 million of revenue to, that could be plugged in the budget. Um, and then, thank you for that clarification. Um, the, the safety drill hearing that was this morning, um, was there any discussion about the number of crisis drills and impact on kids and anything about that, particularly since I think how many drills have students gone through this year, six or seven? I mean, can we be done with that this I, year? I think the recommendation that that was discussed by the fire marshal and, and that is, 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 I believe, in the bill is, um, I think, three fire drill or two tornado drills, three fire drills, and three other safety drills, three to four, and those categories would be uh, the, the division that the fire marshal was suggesting and that 
that, but there was no conversation that that uh, took place about the benefit. And a lot of people were talking about the article that came out, I think, in the Wichita paper, uh, raising that exact issue, but that wasn't discussed in the hearing. Okay, thank you. That, I mean, that so that um, I've heard from parents on that. Yeah. But, um, the so one question I had about the. Um, the, your legislative updates are posted to the website, so any patrons or students, parents, teachers can look and see what's happening. Is there a way to kind of really target which items are um, highly connected with our legislative platform that might warrant um, a call from patrons to their legislators to help them kind of sift through which are more likely to pass or of greater concern in, a, in relation to our legislative platform is that I don't know about the feasibility of that but well um, my, my duty and services to, to you all is to provide you with this kind of information mm -hmm. and I think whatever with through through mr. Smith or however you want to if, if there's I, I, I don't want to be the one to tell people when do they need to right. make calls yeah. that's that that, yeah. that that's in, certainly in your purview but I, I certainly think those are things that could be done with the, the information and I, if, if there's some kind of restructuring or something that might serve those purposes I'm happy to happy to to give you all what you're interested in getting okay. but, yeah. Ms. Mack? Um, I just want to make sure I'm clear um, is that the court order we're supposed to um, have everything tidied up with Gannon by March 1st and the legislature is pushing the school finance bills down the road and basically ignoring that the court wants it all done by March 1st is that correct? Well, the court's deadline is not the first. That's what the attorney general has said. It's escaping me when the oral for when briefs and, and oral arguments are. They're the the middle of April, I believe, is okay. is what it is. So, but the attorney general, whose duty is to prepare briefs and oral arguments on that and and respond to that, wanted to have them in that amount of time so that he would be able to prepare a, a, an adequate defense. Thank you. I have a question with regards to that. Um, the state of the judiciary was not held in the old Supreme Court yeah. building this year. Is that right? That it was back in the it was back in the Supreme Court Center. Is that that correct? I believe that's accurate. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, just for clarification purposes, on the context of the, very, the two Capers bills, the one that's the amortization and the one that's the large pay-in now. Mm -hmm. The large pay-in now is the one that takes money off the table for other things later, or at least that's one of the concerns with it. Is that correct? That if that payment is made now, that then there's less money available for other things? Yeah, out of the pool of revenue that had not been, that, that was, that was um, an ending balance, that the governor had not made any re recommendations on, and she had not made any recommendation about this, this was a legislative initiative that has passed one chamber and likely will pass that would take 115 million out of the the revenue pool okay. may i ask what what is nea's position on the bill may i ask that do you do you know does miss seek do you know um i believe that um i believe that nea would like would like be supportive of it or would like the governor's well, bill of course we want keepers funded right so right, that's what I'm asking for the context so people who are pay, trying to pay attention and decipher what's happening we, at home. We also are cognizant of the fact that if you take, as you begin to chip away at that, that surplus balance or that positive balance that we have now, that is going to uh, continue to shrink as spending continues through the session and we'll need fewer dollars for schools. So the governor did offer a plan that would uh, add money to spread those payments out over time. It's an option as well, too. It's just kind of, you have to kind of just, there's politics going on. So. Yes, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> um, under the dome. That's right. Under the dome. Great feeling that. I think one of, one of the things that was interesting at, when the, at the, the, the meeting with the legislative delegation, the question came up is, I don't, I'm not sure anybody testified in opposition to making the cabers payment but one of the superintendents made the argument that you know it's kind of one of those things to get that needs to get done in particular where we are given 
the impact of what a, a retirement package is here versus across the border and those kind of things and having that's part of in addition to salaries having a stable funded retirement system is a, is an incentive that all of you all need as this district to recruit and retain people and then i have one more question if no one else oh oh, oh everybody has more questions <laughs> I'll, I'll defer i'll start at the end so miss mack you you can just ask and the next it, one just, I, it reminds me of several years ago when they changed the accounting of how much money goes into the classroom and the capers payments were included in that and it really changed the way we so we got to keep an eye on that when yep. that happens mm -hmm. but my question is i don't know if it's for you dr little or if it's for dr sinclair but um I was wondering, I was curious um, about the outcome about um, school board organizational meetings. I know there was a hearing about that and testimony was given. So right. I would like an update on that if it's possible, please. Yeah, either one I'll of start. you are free to answer, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, that was um, actually probably one of the first times I've ever testified in front of a receptive committee, which was kind of fun when I testified wearing a <laughs> Kansas PTA hat. Um, so I think it was a productive conversation. I got the sense um, the committee was going to reconvene and discuss maybe in like two weeks about the resolution, but there were it was all proponents. Um, the Kansas Association of School Boards was neutral, but I think it was described as a neutral supportive position just because there was not agreement about how to resolve among board members across the state. So the opportunity to bring it back to local boards to decide was kind of a welcome support. So I think it went pretty well. Um, and I just wanted to say personally, thank you for jumping on board that and, and preparing that yep. testimony and giving it. Yep. Thank you for doing that. Yep. And the, the, that was Senate Bill 7, correct, that yes. you testified? And then there's another bill, Senate Bill uh, 105, that has a hearing tomorrow, which is another part of that, which just simply says that after the election, uh, the, the term of taking uh, over office is sometime between December 1st and the second Monday in January, just to put some structure since there were some people like, when am I going to start? When, when just to lay some parameters for uh, newly elected folks in the fall. Thank you. And then Dr. Sinclair, you had another question. Okay, so this was moving off the capers. Was yours capers? Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to do that then first? Oh no, actually mine oh. isn't capers. Okay, but okay. Yes. Um, so back to Senate Bill 44 and the the um, school finance um, uh, bills that are out there. Given that, that is kind of our priority among the Shawnee Mission School Board, and it's a Johnson County priority to um, adopt the governor's plan and the plan recommended by the State Board of Education, and um, is that something that we can encourage people as a board? I mean, I don't know if that's a, a, a vote or something that we would do, but just to encourage our patrons to support and move forward with the school finance plan so we can move about our business and making plans and doing good things for our patrons? I don't, I don't know the specific answer to that, but I did just <laughs> see sorry, a video, <laughs> I did just see a video put together by the Blue Valley superintendent just on this issue. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's something that can, we can discuss with Dr. Fulton. <laughs> <laughs> sure, absolutely. It fits with, our, with the legislative platform has mm -hmm. been Right, approved, it's correct. Yeah. So yeah, it's that's a position that the district's taken, and, and it is important to yep. fund it. So I personally would encourage our patrons and parents to reach out, but support support this closure and moving forward with the school finance policy. Or they'll leave it to the last minute. Mm -hmm. um, my final question was with regards to the. Um, tax cut proposal that came out of the Senate, the 26 to 14, for the veto override, they need the 27. 27, that's correct. Um, do we believe that the 26 will hold firm? I'm no, I don't, I'm not singling anybody out. Right. But I'm asking, I mean, do we think we're, I mean, that's, that's relevant information for discussion with regards to what money is going to be available for inflation. If that, I mean, we, we, I have no idea what's happening with regards right. to that in, in the House. Um, so we can presume that the governor is likely not going to approve that, but then will it make it through the Senate after that? I, I think her public comments have suggested that she's not wild about seeing this yes. bill on her desk. Um, and so I think assuming there are 63 votes in the House to pass this bill, um, it, it, 
if it's 63 or 64, I think the concept of having a, um, a veto override is weakened. I think if we, uh, if, if it's in the 70s for the folks that are voting for this or getting up there closer to, a, to the a veto majority in the House, then people would tend to, I think, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cut both. I think the reality will be the bill that will pass the House will be very different from the Senate bill. I think it's going to have a sales tax on food, and it's going to have a lot of other things in it to make it kind of quite a package to, to have to deal with. But it is because there are some pretty sharp divisions as well between those who wanted individual tax relief and the corporate tax relief that was that was challenging enough that the Senate president had to create her own committee and chair her own committee to get it passed suggests that there's not a that there's not broad based massive support for something like that and so it is a um, it, I think a veto override if if the house passes it pretty close a veto override is is probably a, a challenge but you know that's probably a ways from right now anyway okay. thank you it, no. do one yes, last. Dr. Sorry. Sinclair, of course. The shenanigans are back. Um, the, um, I was really disappointed to see the voucher scholarship bullying bill in the House K-12 Budget Committee. And there's not even a, was there a fiscal note on that? Like, I'm just thinking of the chaos that would ensue if any student looks to transfer because of um, an incident of bullying. And that just, just strikes me as, such a chaotic bill, not to mention that it's a voucher bill. Well, and, and uh, again, I should have stated that this is not to make light or, or anything with the issue of bullying by, by any means, right. it's a, but it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, um, it, it would have an impact. Essentially, <clears throat> the way the bill's written is those pupils, those students would be, still be can counted in our, uh, if they were here, be counted in our student count, but then the state treasurer would send a check to the to the account of all those kids here that chose to take a voucher and go to a private school. So it's gonna have significant impact. The state treasurer becomes responsible for tracking and coordinating every one of these accounts. So there's gonna be tremendous cost there as well. I mean, the administrative cost is going to be significant in trafficking this, but you know, to the, you get uh, 20, 10,000 kids out on a voucher, that has an impact. So rather than addressing the issue in the school community and putting resources around addressing bullying you're essentially kicking the can down the road and actually setting up some kids who might not even be welcome in those schools in which they're trying to seek transfers for the very reasons that they're experiencing bullying so it just I'm sorry I'm commentary <laughs> sorry <laughs> So I think that was everybody's questions, unless for some reason President Stratton had one and I wasn't able to see it because he's on the phone. Not hearing any, I think we can probably move on to the next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Stewart. Um, or Dr. Little, sorry. <laughs> um, so moving on to the overview of information and communication technologies program. Okay, and uh, Drew Lane's going to provide a, an a brief overview of the uh, technology program. Dr. Atha, you're back. Welcome. Hi, Dr. Good to see you. you know, he, was, he was engaged in another You stole activity. my fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening. I'm, I apologize for being late to the meeting. I was predisposed to, at another meeting representing the school district. And, uh, but I'm happy to introduce to you Drew Lane, Executive Director of ICT, which will give you an overview of of our technology program. Uh, uh, his report is quite lengthy. I believe it's in excess of 42 pages, but he'll certainly give you a brief summary this evening and he'll be ready to address your questions. Thank you. Good evening. Yes, as enthralling as it might be for me to go through all 42 pages of that report, I recognize that for many, if not all of you, that would not be the same feeling. So we won't be doing that. I will be doing a brief overview of the material that was in there. And uh, Mrs. Winning is going to help me with the, the PowerPoint here. So if we could move to the next slide. You've seen this slide before, probably in other presentations, but it's worth, uh, it's worth a review. Uh, ICT operates, for the most part, out of these two buckets of funds. And the importance behind that is that capital outlay and bond dollars and essentially every other fund the district uses 
are very much siloed and those dollars don't really move from one silo to the next and back and forth, we have to spend out of those. And so when you, th when you see things like refreshes for technology devices and those types of things that come with a large price tag, it's important to understand that those dollars come from capital and capital has to be used and can only be used for items like that. Bond, I spend very few dollars out of bond. Um, mostly bond dollars would be if we have um, large infrastructure that, that comes with a building as part of a building project or something like that we would have. And then ICT does spend uh, some money out of the general fund. Most of those expenditures are for things like subscriptions to services for student support, software, platforms, those types of things. When you look to the ICT budget and you look at the, the 08 fund spend out of there, you'll notice there are a lot of things in there that really go towards uh, student and teacher use platforms and software. So that's why this slide is in here. The cover slide we have here, I put in here just as kind of a reminder for myself uh, to help the board understand how we approach doing this report overall. And really, we kind of went after it with, with two main goals in mind. First was to provide you with a document that would give you an in-depth review of ICT. Pretty much everything we do is in there. The second thing was that it's not something that we had undertaken as a department before, and so provided us an opportunity to do some deep dive and insightful thinking about what we do and how we do it and those types of things. So on that note, let's go ahead and get into the really good stuff. When I think about ICT, we really operate from three standing orders or three, three columns, peers, whatever you want to call it. We want to think of, uh, of working both in a reliable and efficient manner that leads to everyone having the tools that are required to perform their roles, and we wrap all of that up in uh, a safe environment. And safeguarding the technology environment includes both students, teachers, employees, as well as the data they create and the data that we store. Cybersecurity obviously is in the news every single day these days. And the last thing that I would want for the Shawnee Mission School District would be to end up on the front page of a paper that shows that we had some sort of monstrous breach. That being said, we know in the industry that you cannot promise 100% that nothing like that will ever happen. And so in the background, we try very hard to make sure it doesn't happen, but we also have contingency plans for what happens if we get a breach and what would we do there. So those are kind of the three standard operating procedures that we use. As we look at those three kind of standing orders, we had to figure out a way, how, organizationally, how are we going to approach that work? And so we divided the department up into kind of these three areas with one general area that overrides. That general area is the executive director's office, the assistant office uh, security analyst, and then our applications trainer, which really has kind of morphed into a classified personnel trainer. And then there are these three work groups. So you have a work group that deals with uh, data security and, and uh, the data center. You have a group that works with pretty much nothing but data, data analytics, data reporting, those types of things. And then you have a third uh, leg of the stool that provides customer services. And those three areas are then, uh, they're, they're managed by a, a director level person. And the four of us, we meet uh, once a week, talk about the business of the department, and then as, a, as all of our supervisors manage everybody, we also meet once a week to talk about the state of what's going on, what projects in the loop, what are we seeing, those types of things. When you talk about impact and engagement, we looked back to the previous strategic plan and we tried to pick out some areas to highlight here, things that we have done as a department under that previous strategic plan. And it's interesting to see the things that we've done here, how well they, I think, will be able to fold into the new strategic plan. Obviously, some unknowns there, some things will have to morph, take different shape, those types of things. But overall, we're in a great position to continue the good work that we've been doing. And you can see that in some of the impact and engagement points that we have up here. Conclusions, we also want to go back through, look, how did we do? So we identified these areas that worked well, identified areas that work can, but can be better, and then we identified areas that needs immediate improvement. That last column might be alarming at first until you recognize what we put in there were things like fundamental understanding of classroom tech needs. Well, gosh, Drew, you guys don't know what the classroom tech needs in, in terms of technology. That's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is this needs to be top of mind because that changes. It's not static. We know that the needs of a classroom from five years ago to today to five years from now are not going to be the same. So this needs to be front of mind. It needs to be something that's in front of us all the time. 
Um, other things that are in there, clear interdepartmental communications, that's kind of a given as staff come and go. How are we working well to make sure that we have business continuity measures in place, those types of things. And then you always want to look ahead. What are we going to do from here? What's our, this, this is the jumping off point. What pond are we hoping to jump into? Are we going to dive into a shallow pool and hit a rock, or are we going to actually swim and make a go of it? So we looked at our future focus here, and these are areas uh, that I wanted to cherry pick just a couple of things out to provide a little bit more information, but things like uh, under technical network and security services, internet services RFP. One of the things school districts used to do on a regular basis was they would tie their internet connectivity contracts with their wide area network connectivity contracts. We broke those apart. So we put wide area network WAN. It is on a 10-year agreement because that pricing for the last 20 years or so has been incredibly stable. Internet connectivity, the price of bandwidth for internet connectivity, has consistently fallen. So we put that on a three-year cycle, and it reap rewards. This is the first time we were on those contracts again. We were able to reduce uh, the cost of the district by about $66,000 a year for internet service. If we hadn't done that, we would have been stuck with the pricing we had three years ago for another seven years, mm -hmm. and those are just dollars we can't recover. We would have just spent needlessly. Those are the types of things we have in, in the future focus. And then obviously anything that comes up as part of the strategic plan, the things that we'll need to roll in to our future focus as well. But like I said before, we like to think that we've done this open source enough that we're ready to take on anything that plan might throw at us. And with that, I stand for any questions you have. Dr. Sinclair? Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for the detailed evaluation report as well. Okay, now I'm on. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you help me understand, kind of actually, if you go back to maybe the conclusions um, chart, um, maybe, I'm not sure if that's the right one, but help me understand this process from like a user's perspective. So what are you hearing from students? Like what are their kinds of top of mind concerns that, that your department is hearing from and how does that kind of fit into these working well or working better or needs improvement? That, that's, that's it a, just helps me yep. contextualize this yep. information a little better. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, obviously students are some of our most important customers along with teachers and everybody else. From, we hear from students is uh, we hear good but generally what we hear for the most part are, are sometimes we hear concerns around the way VPN does or doesn't work. Okay. That's obviously a concern for us as well. That means that when students are, are off-site, that VPN is what, re, is what enforces content filtering. We know that we have to have that content filtering in place and that that VPN technology is not as solid as we'd like it to be. So that is one thing that we take that feedback and we're looking for alternate solutions to that. Uh, the challenge is that content filtering is a serious cat and mouse game. So it's not just the technology used to enforce content filtering, it's how you do the content filtering itself, okay. and it's the things that you tell the equipment to look at in terms of content filtering that's also fluid and dynamic. But going back to ownership of what we need to do, do better at, uh, VPN is one of those things that probably comes up on a regular basis from students and teachers that says, hey, we'd like to see this be better, and so would we. So is some of the, are some of those things in our control to make those better, or are those kind of obstacles that are outside of the control of the district to address? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of both, honestly. Okay. Uh, some of those things are things we can control, and those pieces uh, that you know, we've, we work on on a regular basis, uh, we, have, we have more success than not, but we'd always like to be more successful at that. And then some of those are things um, that we can't control. Uh, sometimes the VPN doesn't work simply because a person's home internet service provider is having internet weather that day. Or it could be, it could be that they were issued a new uh, home router and that new home router doesn't allow VPN access the way their old router did, those types of things. Those are challenges that are sometimes harder for us to get over because it's not just in the purview of our control. There are other entities involved that uh, sometimes do and sometimes don't want to cooperate on on right. those issues. And the student just needs to turn it in and get it counted. Absolutely. <laughs> turn it in, make sure we know about it. Or get the access. Yep. And like we've, we've seen, you know, there, there have been concerns in the past about, you know, if, if a student has a VPN problem, um, you know, they're being told they still have to turn the homework in and those types of things. I would encourage those parents to most certainly work with the classroom teacher, definitely work with your building administrator. Uh, conversations I've had one-on-one -on -one with building admins and teachers, my own child who has, believe it or not, experienced that problem, right? And I hear about that. Um, 
we talk to teachers, we talk to, uh, to administrators, and those things get resolved. There's, there, I, I really, really like to say that our, our teachers and, and administrators are pretty fair and balanced with their approach to those, those kinds of situations. Not that students might ever exaggerate the level of concern or issue they might have had, uh, so we, there's some investigative part to that as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Goodburn. I love the, this report. It was great. 42 pages of, of, of a lot of detail and charts and everything. And the one that kind of stuck out, stuck out to me was the help desk call times. And I know that you put that kind of in your need, needs immediate improvement that looks like those call hold times and length of calls have kind of gone up the school year. I didn't know what you attributed to that, that to. I would probably first and foremost put that at the feet of the VPN issues that we've had. The VPN issues have been at different times really hard for us to resolve. Uh, they don't present the same way every time. And sometimes it's ebb and flow. Uh, sometimes we have more calls than others. Um, it could be one day we have everybody who is employed is at work, and some days not everybody that's employed in that, that faculty is at work. One of the things I think we'll have to take a look at down the road somewhere in terms of I ICT is, is our staffing. I think we'll probably really have to take a strong look at our staffing model and decide um, are, we, are we as efficient as we could be there in terms of who's doing what? Are there enough people doing those types of things? I'm not advocating either way right at the moment, just saying that's something we really are going to have to take a solid look at. And then we also need to be more innovative in how people access uh, that kind of help. Uh, additionally, I think there is probably a lot more capacity in our buildings to do some basic troubleshooting with student groups and those types of things that we, we should probably make a better effort to access. Um, those are all things that probably going to hear from in terms of strategic planning, might hear from those types of things through the new uh, digital learning task force, those areas. Um, but yeah, those, those are things that we look at and we're concerned about as well. Thank you again mm -hmm. for the report, though. It was really great. Certainly. Okay, Dr. Sinclair. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other, looking at the chart, the conclusions in that box under automated and more timely data regarding critical building level reporting, that piece there, um, what kind of jumped out at me in, in that piece is just thinking about, we heard earlier tonight from folks from the um, asking for more. Uh, progress around equity and inclusion and part of that is really kind of being able as a I would think as a, a building level leader to be able to understand what's happening in our building in terms of our populations of kids hitting on key benchmarks whether it's attendance or discipline issues or so those kinds of counts and being able to as a principal or a teacher look at how how are we doing as a building are we kind of hitting proportional kinds of um, targets and is that something that is a, and maybe I'm asking a bigger district issue, is that something we could, is that something that would be discussed or something to work towards so that we have that infrastructure? And I'm not even sure if that's what you were, you know, talking about here when you're talking about building level data reporting. Is that kind of what you had in mind, more of that student data or, or um, more administrative kinds of things? So if, if you would indulge me, I'll, I'll, I would like, I'll speculate just a little bit to answer your question. Okay. When, we look at, when we look at automated more timely data regarding critical building level reports, we're looking at first and foremost, what data do we already collect? What data do we already possess? How can we present that data? So it's from, from my office. So it's like a, attendance data. Correct. Students' attendance yes. data or suspension data or Attendance, or? punctuality, uh, absence, okay. you know, those okay. types of things. Um, you know, what, what day, is there a common day of the week that a certain student misses and is that impactful in some way, shape, or form? These, these, are, these are very functional questions for us mm -hmm. in, in the sense that these are very large data sets. We would like to incorporate even larger data sets into that mm -hmm. and, and apply uh, much more powerful analytics against those data sets to see if there are, are patterns, if there are recommendations, if there are conclusions that we could draw from those data sets that we can't do today simply due to capacity um, in, in, in analysis. And so, you know, the, the, the kind of the buzz phrase in, in the industry today is artificial intelligence. Uh, if you ask Elon Musk, it's going to kill us all. And if you ask uh, the guys from Google, they're going to tell you that it's going to save us all. I think the answer is somewhere in between those two, to be honest with you. Hopefully it's somewhere in between those two. Okay. But honestly, for a district of our size and the data sets that we work with, I think we have to give serious consideration to solutions like those 
in the not distant future to um, application towards some of these more complex questions we're asking because they are exceedingly compact, complex questions. To look at a student overall and, and that student's performance academically, there are so many things that feed into that. How regularly do they, do right. they eat? How often are they at school? How often are they at school on time? What is their route from home to school? Do they walk? And when they walk, is it mostly cold? Is, I mean, there are a variety of things that we don't necessarily have the capacity to analyze today, but we should in the future. So you were even thinking bigger than I, I mean, I love that, and just looking at programmatically kind of that analytical approach. I was even thinking more simply of just basic descriptive statistics and breaking it down by you know, key kind of populations that we're trying to make sure we're closing achievement gaps with, and just even having that descriptive data information kind of at your fingertips, kind of an aggregate at your building level, and then be able to de-aggregate by target groups. Mm -hmm. So I was even thinking a lot, um, just kind of, yeah. But I, I value that too. That would be incredibly helpful. Well, and that's, <sighs> It's part of the solution building that we're trying to do. You know, so the data is the data is there. It's it's so well, important. it's it's mostly there. Some of it is not very clean. That's particularly true when you get in discipline data. And the other thing you get into is, uh, in some of the data sets, you don't you have very small ends. As, as you as you know, when you look at mm -hmm. if you're answering a certain problem and you only have three out of thirty students that mm -hmm. fit that in. Mm -hmm then you really can't use that data of very limited value. Mm -hmm. You've got to get a lot bigger yeah. data set than that. Yeah. So that's part of what we're working on is trying to get a, not only the technology that we have to work effectively for us, but make sure we get our research questions down and then our ability to yeah. dive deep into that data and do the analysis accomplished in a time efficient way. Thank you. It's just gonna be such an important part of us being able to move forward with some of the priorities that we're hearing from the community and from this group, so thank you for that. Certainly, and what you heard me say earlier in that needs improvement column, really mm -hmm. these are things that we know need to stay front of mind for us and, mm -hmm. and be open-minded enough to look at, mm -hmm. at situations, realize that maybe the solutions we have or have been using um, don't function as well as others might. We want to remain open to that, be very conscious about budget. Some of those tools can be very expensive very quickly, uh, but certainly want to make sure we just want, I just wanted to impress upon the board tonight that, that your, your technology department is open-minded and looks at things like that as possibilities rather than we can't do this because. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It looks like Ms. Goodburn has one more question. It, yes, not a question, but oh. it's amazing, the service desk repair savings comparison that you have in, this, in, the, in your larger report. That's amazing, that the amount that, since we have a service desk that's able to repair our devices, the amount of savings that we're getting for that is just amazing. So. So the district invested uh, a couple of years ago, I'm not exactly sure how long ago, but invested in making sure that all of our field personnel are certified to perform warranty work on our own devices. And since we've done that, you can see the savings we've been able to uh, acquire. Um, and, and those dollars then can get shuffled into other places to do other things. It's great to have those dollars to not think, oh, I've got to have those dollars to fix stuff. I've got those dollars to do something that could be even more impactful. Thank you. Thank you. So we're moving on to 4.1, the approval of the consent items. And before we do that, I think there's an item on the agenda, the consent agenda that Dr. Fulton is gonna to speak to because I know it's of interest to folks. Yes, absolutely, thank you. I'll just take a few minutes here. Uh, well, we've been conducting a search for the Director of Special Education. Uh, we had 20 applicants, interviewed seven of those applicants with uh, a final, with an interview with a finalist that included the superintendent. I got involved at the finalist stage and uh, we're very pleased tonight to recommend Sherry Dumoulin as the new director of special education. I wanna give you a little bit of information about the search. We, uh, for, we, we began by giving a staff survey uh, and of which we had 205 people respond. So that was good. We wanted to see what district staff wanted in the new director. And then we also gave a parent guardian survey. We had 285 responses to that survey, so that was good. 
When we actually got into the interview process, 17 staff members participated, of which six were special education staff members, four were building administrators, and seven were non-SPED district administrators. Here are some key facts about Sherry. She has a, uh, she's been a special education teacher. She's a K-12 behavior specialist. She has served as a district special education coordinator. Uh, she's been an assistant director of special education. She has served in Shawnee Mission before from 2015 to 2018, and she currently works in the DeSoto School District. Throughout her career, she's distinguished herself in a number of ways, including broad and deep technical uh, knowledge about teaching and learning. She's an excellent communicator, a trusted relationship builder, a skilled trainer, experience with new staff recruitment and onboarding new staff, and extensive experience with Kansas SPED legal compliance and mediation process. And so we're very uh, pleased to be able to bring her to, uh, forward to you for approval tonight, along, of course, with all of the other consent agenda items. So I will seek a motion to approve. Move approval. Second. All those in favor say, say aye. 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 Still there. <laughs> so it looks like that uh, passes 6-0. And then we'll move on to 5-1, approval of the Scholastic Journalism Week proclamation. Um, and I think you're going to read that proclamation for us, Patty. I am. But Mrs. Owsley, I hope you don't mind if I take a little bit of, of liberty here. I noted that there are several journalism teachers and journalism students here. And because this is uh, has to do with Scholastic Journalism Week, and I got a lovely letter from your editors, assistant editors, et cetera, would you mind standing so we can recognize you tonight, all of the journalism students and the teachers? Would you mind before I read this? Thank you. Um, you can tell I'm the proud mother of three Shawnee Mission journalism students, so thank you for doing that. Um, whereas, and I move this proclamation, whereas scholastic journalism, journalism has been a part of high school curriculums for decades, and whereas the goal of scholastic journalism programs across the nation is to enable young people to learn and practice the right of free press and to obtain the ability to express and exchange ideas, which is essential to a democracy, by writing, editing, and producing student publications, and whereas research has shown that students who are trained in and practice journalism have a higher achievement level on standardized tests and college English classes, and whereas scholastic journalists have been guided in the practice of journalism by the Kansas Scholastic Press Association and their respective journalism advisors, and whereas February 18th through 24th, 2019 has been designated Scholastic Journalism Week throughout the country. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Shawnee Mission Board of Education does hereby proclaim February 18th through 24th, 2019, Scholastic Journalism Week in the Shawnee Mission School District and congratulate student journalists and their advisors for their continued work in journalism education. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes six to zero. Um, and so we'll be moving on to five two approval revised board policy on BBC board committees. And this is the second reading and we discussed it at the last meeting. Um, Move approval. Second. Do we need to open it up for any discussion before we vote? Mm -hmm. uh, Miss Guy or Reverend Guy, did you have? Oh, sorry, no. I saw your hand. In so if there are no comments, I guess we just vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 6-0. Um, and that moves on to 5-3, approval of the proposed pre-K tuition increase. Um, I don't know, Dr. Fulton, if you had any comments on this. Um, we are proposing uh, an increase for next year's pre-K tuition. You know, this is a program that basically has to run in a cost-neutral way. And this tuition increase over the next two years keeps us on track to do that. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. I'll second, just so we can discuss it. Okay. I'll have Dr. Neal come forward. She's the expert. She'll be happy to respond to any questions. <laughs> 
Good evening. Does anyone have any questions? Um, so, uh, are we looking at a four hundred dollar increase? Is that the way I see? I read Correct. That? So, right now, um, currently, um, let's take a step back and just remind ourselves that to provide pre-K in Shawnee Mission, it's done through a braided um, system of funding. So, we have our um, our no fee programs where families have to meet qualifiers. Um, we have some that are title programs that, again, you have to meet qualifiers to attend. And then um, we also recognized that there were families that maybe didn't meet any qualifiers, but still were interested in receiving high quality pre-K education in Shawnee Mission. So we started the tuition program. And so that's, this is the piece that we're looking at tonight. We have, um, right now currently it's 2550, 10, uh, installment payments. So the proposal in front of you would be to increase that to $29.50 for the 1920 school year, 10 installment payments of $295. Okay. And what is the role of the title funding impacting this program? Because that's one of the four revenue sources, right? There's title and TANF and um, at risk, four year old at risk dollars and so the title funding simply funds um, the program specifically at title buildings. And as you know, we have, uh, we have identified uh, the four schools that will continue um, to be supported um, through title funding for this coming year. So that's just separate for them. So those um, families to attend um, no fee in those particular buildings, um, they could meet a qualifier similar to what the um, four-year-old at risk would be, but also if they didn't meet those, but they reside in a Title I uh, area, school-wide Title I area, they could attend at no fee because it's funded through title funding. Okay. The others, um, the four-year-old at risk and the, um, can the KPP grant that we receive, um, those virtually have almost identical qualifiers <coughs> with the exception uh, of the fact that KPP allows free or reduced. Um, the four-year-old at risk um, narrows that to uh, free lunch only as one of the about eight to nine qualifiers for families. Okay. Just for context, can we, um, I'm not as familiar with this program as some of the other programs. How many hours a day is this, the pre-K that they're paying the $295 a month for? And So it's a half day, that's a great question. It's a half day program. We have AM and PM sessions and they run from um, 8.15 to 11 or 12.15 to three. And they are five day a week programs. So it's half day, five days per week. And that's throughout the course of the academic year? Correct. Are we one of the only districts that offers that or do all the districts offer something to that effect? So I, think, I mean, in the Johnson County area. Sorry, I'm not meaning all of right. the districts everywhere. <laughs> um, in Johnson County, I would say that um, there are some, for example, Blue Valley um, run, offers a program that is more similar to what um, we offer at the uh, Early Childhood Center in that they are not receiving um, those, they don't receive those grant funds, but they are serving certainly the three and four year olds um, that have active IEPs alongside peer models. So that is um, a fairly common um, offering in Johnson County. Um, but um, for us, we've been fortunate. I think there are, there are other districts that do utilize some four-year-old at risk, um, but I don't have that information data in front of me to share with you. So I would wanna look at that before, but I'm happy to get it for you. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, yes, Reverend Guy. Um, so you, you said that this next year the tuition would increase from 2550 to 2950. Um, your recommendation is also that the following year it will increase again a total of 31% over the two years. So correct. So um, tonight I believe the, the, um, the motion in front of you is really for 1920, but I did, you're correct, in the backup material, um, I was asked to put together a two-year plan um, because taking it from 2550 to 3350, I felt like was a really steep uh, jump for families. Um, so that's phased over the course of the two-year period. Um, we are very fortunate in Shawnee Mission to be able to offer outs what I would say is outstanding 
um, early childhood, and that is um, because we have attracted um, really fine educators. Um, and um, to meet the ratios, not only do we have a teacher in those classrooms, but we also have um, educational aides supporting, uh, and they have to meet a certain level um, based on the grants. There are some really specific requirements. And so um, because of that, um, sometimes um, those qualifications that really um, allow us to offer exceptional programming, um, it's they outpace necessarily, and so that's really um, the conundrum here. And so, by bringing that to 2950, we really are um, bringing, really bringing the tuition piece up to more closely look at and match what we receive from the state for the four-year-old at risk for this coming year, and then the additional increase that will be looked at for the following year really just brings it up to to be really cost neutral. But that's based on current costs right now. No further questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Passes 6-0. And I think that moves us on to the end of the evening with comments from board members. Um, Ms. Mack? Um, thank you, Mrs. Owsley. Thank you for that choir concert tonight. That was so kind. It just, it makes, it reminds us why we're here. And it was just fabulous. Thank you for Thank you for delaying that so I could be here <laughs> to You're hear very that. Welcome. Um, I just have a couple of things. Um, first of all, we lost um, a wonderful person recently. My niece and nephews had uh, Larry Martin as a teacher at Belinda. He was an incredible man, a fabulous educator, and he will be missed by many. I just wanted to mention him. Um, I do have a question that I acknowledge, Dr. Fulton, I'm putting you on the spot, so I'm just going to tell you that right now. Are you prepared to make any statement about snow days and makeup? Because we have, how many snow days have we had so far? Too many. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we are. We'll, uh, we'll come back at the de okay. next board meeting with a, with a plan. Okay. Hopefully, we're not going to have any more snow days. I hope I didn't just jinx Hopefully. myself by saying that, right? So. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah. I, I just so I think something to be, you know, you know, we obviously we can't say anything now because we're right. that there's going to be more, but I just right. think we might want to say challenge. something. We, we, we need to get an all clear signal from the yeah. from okay. weather before we make the decisions. But yes, we are into that. You're zone doing a really good job, but I don't think you can forecast that. No, so. I can't forecast <laughs> that. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is um, I know that um, Dr. Fulton, you said we weren't going to say anything about the two retirements in the consent agenda tonight. However, I'm not going to be here in June of 2020. And so I wanted to take a moment. Dr. Strike is not here, I don't think. Oh my gosh, Dr. Strike, I didn't write down stuff for you. Okay, you got to wait. <laughs> um, but I, next board meeting. But um, Mr. Douglas, Chief, you are amazing. You are the epitome of class. You um, effortlessly mix professionalism and compassion for others in a way I've never seen before. You make me and my family feel safer. Um, thank you for everything that you've done. You're a natural leader. You're a natural teacher. What you've done with Blue Eagle is exceptional. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment, those are just quickly things off the top of my head, I just wanted to tell you, thank you. That's it. You're next. <laughs> uh, Ms. Goodburn. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to note um, a, a very enterprising theater student from South who was here earlier for the oh, SMAC yeah. presentation. She, she gave you all cards. Um, their production is this weekend, Jesus Christ Superstar, starts on the 13th through the 16th. And um, she was such a bubbly um, uh, student and very excited about their performance and so I thought I would give that her a shout out and their performance a shout out this weekend too. I'm sure that tickets are available. It's at Shawnee Mission South, Jesus Christ Superstar, February 13th through the 16th. Uh, Reverend Guy? I feel like I'm like... I know, I feel like you're very <laughs> far away actually. <laughs> uh, I attended the kickoff last Tuesday night for the um, strategic planning process, the steering committee, and uh, I thought it was a, a great energy in the room, and I'm really excited about the people that will be on the steering committee, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Fulton and Dr. Hubbard in particular 
for really, really working to get as much diversity as we possibly can. Um, and that, that involved making some phone calls and, and, and trying to convince people to be a part of this process. And I really appreciate that. I'm very excited about the group that's gonna gather together. I think they are gonna represent all the different parts of our community here. And um, I'm really looking forward to the conversations we're gonna have about what the future holds for Shawnee Mission School District. So thank you to all the people who submitted um, a nomination form and thank you uh, to you and Dr. Hubbard for putting together what I think is gonna be a great group to work with. Dr. Sinclair? Um, uh, on that vein, I would encourage um, folks to check out the thought exchange, so part of that strategic planning process and helping us kind of define and communicate what it is we think our class of 2030, our first graders this year, are going to need to know and to be able to do and, and why that might be important. I think that's a really great opportunity to um, have a community-wide conversation. So I would encourage you to check it out. Um, and I'll just reiterate my thanks to everyone who came this evening to speak to the board and for all the efforts that they've done um, to promote diversity and inclusion and cultural competency in the district. We know that's an important issue and I, I know that that's a lot of work that they're doing on their own time to make our district a better place for all of our students and so it's very much appreciated. And then when we were going over the technology um, discussion this evening, I was thinking about all of the folks that volunteered to sign up for the Technology Advisory Committee and, and how that's going to come to fruition based off of our alteration of the policy tonight. And so it's, it's good to see everyone stepping up to be a part of and donating their time to make things better. Um, and it's an exciting time in the district. So I just wanted to make sure everybody got our thanks for that. Um, and I guess at this point, if there's no, I mean, excuse me, Mr. Stratton, did you have any final comments this evening? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't want to leave him out and I don't, I can't see him. So <laughs> we'll have uh, Ms. Goodburn send us into executive session. I move we go into executive session to discuss confidential student information pursuant to the exception relating to actions adversely or favorably affecting a student under coma and the open meeting will resume in the boardroom at I have a wall. Yeah. Um, I think 8.30. Should we, and we, eight, wait, should we take like five minutes before we go back to executive session and then tack that oh, on top Oh, we still it? have business to do, so oh, I don't yeah. think that no. that's an appropriate time to do that. Oh, okay. I mean, that no, that's fine. My, I don't know. Okay, I that's fine. That, um, so I think we should do this and then we can okay. come back and then you might be able to have the five minutes. Okay. Or maybe, I don't know. Okay, um, so I'd say 8.30. Okay. All those in favor? No, second. second. Oh, say, need a second. second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> Passes 6-0. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so, so we just, yeah. We so uh, um, on the matter of the consideration of appeal of student suspension E19-3, I recommend um, that the Board of Education uphold the district's recommendation. Um, yeah, hold it. Okay. Is there, a, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's uphold, upheld six to zero. And then we move on to our next um, executive session, and I'll have you read that for us, sir. I move we go into executive session to discuss litigation with our legal counsel pursuant to the exception for matters which would be deemed privileged in an attorney-client relationship under the coma, and that the board will reconvene in the boardroom at 
Do we need, tw we need 20 minutes? 20. So 9.02? Do you want to make it 9.05 and take a three minute break before then? Mm -hmm. Or no? 9.05. 9.05? Okay. All right, so we'll be back Wait, here. Oh, 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 we, we have need a second. We have to vote. <laughs> we need the second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Brad, you there? Hi, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, passes 6 0. And then do we go ahead and talk about the second executive session no, now? We have to come back, we out, have to come back out and do it. So Let's we come have back and do it separately. Right. Okay. Stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. Your kid, your kid. I'm, 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 I'm,